I can do things that wear it without asking anybody, even my Coney wife. Coney Island, world's biggest barrel of fun. And anywhere else your imagination takes you. Okay, we've done that now, Mark. We'll get the whole show now. You hurry, hurry, hurry. Anything's possible at Disneyland. Welcome aboard the Themed Attraction Podcast, where we take you for a ride through the epic universe of theme park design, that is. You've just set sail on a voyage of discovery and discussion with theme park industry masters of the craft. I'm your skipper, Freddie Martin, and sailing the seas with me as always is theme park designer, master planner, and chief creative officer of Storyland Studios, Mel McGowan. Where are we headed today, Mel? We'll strap in, Freddie, because we're headed to the deadly shores of Skull Island to interview Mike West, Senior Director and Executive Producer for Universal Parks and Resorts around the world. With the first quarter century of his career spent at Walt Disney Imagineering and the second half underway at Universal, Mike's just one of those guys that you can't help but geek out over. Uh, all the while, he hasn't lost his joy and passion for experience uh, for the design industry. Uh, Mike treats his own expertise with an open hand, always willing to pass down knowledge to the next generation. That is true. Uh, besides his deep voice, he has a deeper desire to see this industry become better and better. All right, folks, keep your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the boat because this episode is about to leave the dock. Hit it, Sam. Well, Mel, we're back from Florida. Uh, I'm pretty wiped out after I app, I've got to tell you. The dogs are barking, man. <laughs> the feet are just recovering. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's it's really good to be back in the Storyland Studios um, Blue Sky Loft. Uh, folks listening, if you hear noise, that's just the magic being made out there in the uh, um, in our big facility here. Um, could be grinding noises, could be foaming noises, could be ooh, who knows? Big secrets in it's the brain works. juice leaking <laughs> leakages. Well, um, I, I got to tell you, having spent time at, uh, especially a lot of time in Flo- uh, Florida, hanging out at the Universal Resort, um, it just this week really reaffirmed my appreciation for everything that's there. I mean, that there's really it's a limited space, and they've been able to do so much with it, um, uh, with both with hotels, with retail, with dining, um, all of it um, being anchored by these theme parks that uh, are uh, even closer together now that there's a train that runs between them. I mean, this is um, uh, a master work in uh, urban design. Well, you know, Bob Ward's a good, again, another friend and mentor mm-hmm. of mine. Uh, we've got some members of our team that worked on the planning and the landscape architecture of that original um uh, <laughs> I forgot what that lame original name was. Uh, oh. Universal uh, Escape or Universal Studios Escape. So kind of a, a, a branding blunder. But again, like you said, a master planning and urban design uh, masterpiece, really the, the first multi-gate uh, pedestrian oriented mm-hmm. Um, destination resort. I mean, uh, you know, as you know, Disney World kind of is suburban sprawl spread out over 40 plus square miles. Yeah. Uh, but again, I, I know when we were working on uh, the expansion of California Adventure and, and developing out Disneyland's parking lot, uh, it was a great benchmark for us. And uh, we didn't have the, the high water table of Florida, so we couldn't have these great <laughs> water features and canal systems linking everything. Uh, but again, uh, in, in terms of an example of how to integrate so many different hotels, uh, multiple games, uh, a great retail dining entertainment district um, uh, at, a, at a way that really still is legible uh, but has a sense of discovery that has pedestrian connectivity uh, where you don't have to rely on uh, water launches or but but planes trains and automobiles yeah, if yeah. you don't want to uh, definitely a, a, a wonderfully complex and diverse uh, uh, and fun experience um, but as my family have all become potterheads oh. <laughs> uh, really because of the the environments that have been created. Uh, I got to admit, uh, I don't think any of us uh, had read the books before uh, experiencing uh, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. Uh, and of course, now uh, they've all gone through and 
uh, read all the literature to, to just make that experience even deeper. Um, this was a fun trip for uh, you and I to be able to tour uh, two of our uh, different theme park clients that we're developing master plans for and, and you know, explain the whole idea of multi-gate destination resorts uh, and how that actually comes together on the ground. But but also to be able to ride uh, Hagrid's uh, motorbike adventure. Oh, my goodness. What did you think of that? Well, that was something else. I mean, the, from the pre-show um, sort of surprise to the onboard um, launch coaster. There's not a there's not a crank up the hill uh, part about this ride at all. You are racing through um, Hagrid's backyard, and it is it is something else. I mean, I I don't want to give away any of the surprises, but every time I I turned around, I thought, wait, 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 how can they pack all of this into one roller coaster? It's amazing. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it it is the next evolution. And particularly, you know, in terms of roller coasters, uh, to do something that's in that realm of family friendly, Mm -hmm. but packs a punch, lots of thrills. Lots of immersion, lots of story, but also to do that without the the surprise, for example, of Radiator Springs Racer of having a a, a large uh, show building, yeah, uh, and a you know to do as much as they did uh, with exterior uh, sets and, and the surprises along the way, um, you know, just gotta applaud that team for what they pulled out and what a great compliment to uh, the overall experience of Hogsmeade Village and yeah. and uh, the you know the screen based uh, stuff going on in the uh, original Forbidden Journey attraction there. Yeah, and it was. Like you, you mentioned, we, we got to tour around uh, a couple clients, help them see. I mean, that was part of um, what makes Universal so so unique. That whole resort there in Florida is is to be able to see so many different uh, integrated uh, activities happening in one quick and small place um, helps you to kind of see how you're going to develop your own uh, park um effort whatever whatever uh things that uh, are being master planned if if a client's coming to you asking a question uh, how do you do this universal is a pretty cool place to show them uh, it is cool and it's, it's cool to see the evolution again for a, a movie company to to rely on screen-based digital media that that's obviously a, a natural go-to because of yeah, the right. flexibility and the ability to be so true to the original ips but it is fun to experience the evolution as they've stepped into more uh, practical sets and fully immersive uh, realized environments and and um you know even exterior you know hardware type attractions like uh, hagrid's it's it's just a blast. Yeah. Well, our guest today, Mike West, is going to talk a bit about that. Um, a bit about Mike right now. He's the senior director, executive producer, producer at uh, NBC Universal. He's a member, obviously, of the <laughs> International Board of Directors of the Themed Entertainment uh, Association. He's responsible for Kong Skull Island, which uh, is that uh, dark ride slash 4D uh, film slash uh, immersive experience. <laughs> you know, it's a track. Uh, uh, simulator ride um, through some pretty cool dark ride areas. I mean, this is it, it's uh, state of the art, right in uh, in Kong Skull Island. Um, uh, he did the Simpsons ride, Transformers the ride, 3D, Despicable Me, and before that, he was show writer and producer for 25 years, I think, uh, at Epcot uh, at, at Walt Disney Imagineering, doing uh, show writing and things at Epcot. And, As uh, any regular listeners know, anyone that had anything to do with the creation of the original Epcot are yeah. all heroes in our eyes. Yeah, so. that's absolutely true. Um, one thing I really loved about interviewing Mike West, um, besides the breadth of amazing stories he has to tell from personal experience, was his understanding that the passing of information is what will continue to the unique evolution of this industry that we're in. So, um, Mel, I've seen you do the same thing with your staff, passing information along, passing native knowledge. And we do that here on the podcast. It's part of the reason why we have this podcast, help people in the industry share information. So for this industry that really does thrive on secrets, right, keeping good secrets, it's also important to plan the safe passage of information, principles, knowledge, uh, and ideas. How, how do you see that um, being lived out here in this industry today? Well, um, you know, you, you're right. It was kind of a double whammy of the, the nature of the industry uh, between the confidential NDAs, secretive, you know, competitive 
ness of the industry, and, and also the fact that no one gets screen credits. You know, yeah. uh, unlike a movie, for all the armies of anonymous, relatively anonymous people, there, there's at least some credits. There's Oscar yeah, awards. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so, really, this kind of ties back into the the roots of the themed entertainment association, which I've been involved with for over a dozen years. You know, and Monty with his original idea for uh, creating this uh, kind of industry support group. You know, of, of uh, <laughs> you know these uh, the original former. Imagineers and business owners that we'd get together and kind of, uh, you know, talk about, hey, how do we get paid, you know, from these Chinese clients? And how do we, you know, and again, one of those early things we we uh, understood was an issue was that uh, when it came to passing from one generation to the next, um, you didn't have, uh, you know, like what happened with Epcot is they were forced out of necessity to raise up this uh, second generation of guys, the Tony yeah, Baxters yeah. and uh, Mikes of the world uh, that were under the tutelage of that original WED uh, Enterprises uh, Imagineering team of Mark Davis and and Rolly Crump and those guys. Uh, but that that wasn't happening uh, on an ongoing basis. And so we've really had to uh, create kind of this uh, next gen kind of initiative to be really strategic, create these bridges with all these uh, emerging design schools that have really, uh, you know, risen to the challenge and even created entire curriculums and programs That's uh, right. around themed entertainment uh, design with schools like SCAD and Cal Arts and um, and you know I'm I'm blessed to recently being able to join the board of uh, our local themed entertainment association uh, board and and really that's it's just something we all it's it's not just a feel good do good thing this is like a necessity for our industry because what we do is so different from what traditional architectural programs are spitting out yeah. uh, it's so different from what uh you know film schools are spitting out um it, it's just a unique industry and it has a unique skill set and really uh, the ability to bridge kind of all the amazing uh, kind of emerging talent out there with uh, creating a funnel uh, in this industry is so key yeah, well, folks like uh, Mike West are doing that open, open-handedly, um, uh, offering that uh, guidance to the next generation. So let's get into this. Uh, let's uh, we better get our little trackless motion simulator 4D screen dark ride rolling. We're off again to Orlando, Florida, to uh, the Orange County Convention Center, where we interviewed this week's guest, Mike West. Well, uh, thank you, Mike, for uh, joining with us today on the Themed Attraction Podcast. This is uh, a real honor to hang out with you oh, here at uh, IAPA. Uh, those of you who are listening in, this is a big, giant room. There's going to be people walking in and out because we're at the International Attractions. Uh, wait, International Association of uh, Amusement Parks and Attractions Expo, which is the world's biggest possible convention <laughs> it's the center of it all yeah it really is so uh thanks for being on sure my pleasure great great to be here yeah so uh for those who aren't aware um of uh your career we just want to kind of um go back I mean, you there's so many people who have been involved in, and been to theme parks and wondered who does this stuff and you've had a really storied career so give me the the the, the 50 cent tour of <laughs> mike west's uh, well, I've been very blessed. I've been doing this for, it'll be 40 years the next year between uh, Disney and Universal and some things in between. Um, it's, it's been amazing. I mean, what, what other career can you have where your, your constant strive is to make people happy and mm-hmm. to have a good time? You know, that's really a blessing to be able to spend your life doing that and see the result of people coming out of an attraction that you spent three or four years working on going, ah, that was amazing. I loved it. <laughs> or the other way that they don't. But <laughs> <laughs> that happens. That never happens with my attractions, though. Yeah. So where'd you start out? I started out with Walt Disney Imagineer as a communications three or two writer doing nomenclature for the Italy, Japan, and Mexico. Oh, buildings. wow. Yeah, it was pretty cool. My mom heard I was a writer for Disney. She went, oh, really? What scripts do you do? And I said, I'm naming shops. At <laughs> yeah. Epcot. That's my job. So um, it was pretty cool. I started out, actually, the, the way I got there was, was pretty wild. Um, I'm a big Philadelphia sports fan, bleed mm. Philadelphia sports. Um, and I was on my way to a Dodgers-Phillies game, and I stopped in a supermarket to get something to take to the game with me. And I had my Phillies cap on, and this tap on the shoulder goes, hey, yo, you from Philly? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, my good man. I can tell from your excellent elocution, you must be from the same region. Turns out uh, he was a young engineer at the time working on something called Epcot Center for a company called Wed Enterprises. Mm-hmm. 
and we got to know each other and, and found out about it. And uh, uh, I gave him a resume because at the time I was writing, I was a media manager for a chain of retail stores. So I thought, this sounds a lot more interesting. So um, nothing happened to it. Uh, a little while later, my wife convinced me to go to a, um, uh, an employment agency to see what was available. And I sat down to talk to this guy and I was talking to him for about 10 seconds. And he said, I don't deal with your kind of people. And mm. I went, really? Today you'd get arrested for saying something like that. <laughs> he said, you need to talk to that woman behind you. So I literally rotated my chair around without getting out of it to the desk behind me. And this woman said, well, if you had anywhere in the world you'd want to work, where would it be? And I said, well, there's a company you probably never heard of it called Wed Enterprises. She was Marty Scalar's wife's aunt. Are you kidding me? Out of the blue, <laughs> right? Talk about guide incidents. I yeah, mean, right. It was this, obviously, I got an interview from it. In fact, when I got my 20-year ring, Marty gave it to him and he, he made an announcement to the crowd. He said, you know, once Rosalie sent Mike over, we never took anybody else. Oh, <laughs> so I said, well, when you get the best. Yeah, that's right. Else? Why stop? Yeah, Why? <laughs> so it, was, it was a very auspicious beginning. No, oh, that's cool. Hey, just a uh, history question. We're, so you, you, you hadn't heard of WED or you? Not at the no, time. No. Not at the time. So um, how, how were people thinking about Epcot at that time? Did people still in the, like the culture wise, were they still wondering if Walt's Epcot would ever be oh, made? I think so. Yeah, yeah. In the early eighties, it was still a lot of what would Walt do. I mean, that was, again, I was so blessed that I got to, to WDI at a time when the original masters that started this yeah. whole business were still there. Yeah. Right. So I got to learn the fir from the first generation and they were obviously very tightly connected with Walt and had a lot of his, his history and his ideals. And of course, Marty was, was my main mentor and he was all about that. So he, taught me everything oh that's that's fantastic um yeah that you my next question was about mentors so um what was it like to work side by side to uh, even that education process was it more on purpose or was it just uh, you're stuck to a guy and that's how you learn uh, well marty was the boss that's one yeah. way you learn and and i was a writer by trade so marty being a writer he kind of kept the the writers close and we were kind of a special group for him but um all those guys were there i mean exitensio was another one of my yeah, main mentors so i just adored um but blaine gibson and waythel rogers these guys they just they said come in on the office sit down and talk yeah. and they didn't think twice about telling you their life history and about the company and mm. you could go back and stay in Blaine Gibson's studio with him and watch him carving figures yeah. you know and, and sculpting <laughs> things and of course at the time I was a young kid I didn't know I was like oh this is kind of cool yeah um, but then re you realize who these people were and and it, their whole thing was they they were so open to share everything mm. you know there was no egos involved um, and so that's always been my goal as I got older was to pass that on to a lot of other young people because they gave it to me yeah I think um Nathan, you've felt that same experience, haven't you? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I remember when we first met, uh, I was working on the Simpsons ride on some, you know, back lot trailer at uh, Universal Studios Florida, and, and I'm listening to you acting out the Simpsons um, in, in the next door, and, and I'm getting weeks and weeks of this, you know. And, but but then of course always there's the Friday afternoon. Hey, let's go and talk about our week and that sort of thing. Yeah, so that was yeah, it was great. it was good. I mean, yeah. that's one thing I always love to do is get into the characters. I have kind of got known for doing crusty during the Simpsons. Oh yeah, so there was a lot of crusty. every time I did that. Yeah. Even on the Today Show, Al Roker said, "So I understand you do crusty." Of course, we'd had a crusty battle off then at that point, but because <laughs> you know, Al does a lot of stuff. Oh, that's great. Um, so so uh, voice. Doing voice, you've done a lot of voice, and you've got to be around some of those uh, great Disney legends too. Extensio, Throw Ravenscroft. So, yes. tell me about that. That's a well, cool ex, experience. Well, I started a group called No Do Productions mm. at WDI, and that was uh, <laughs> we would grab somebody off the hallway, bring him in, throw him into the Studio A booth, and record lines for the show because it was a lot less expensive to yeah. do it that way. But sometimes you got to work with the pros, and um, I w I did Max the Deer for the Country Bear Christmas oh, yeah. and the Vacation Show. That was you. That was me. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, and Thor Ravenscroft, of course, was there. And, and one time, Frank Welker was in there. So the three of us were in the booth together. And, of course, I, I have a sort of a deep voice, but you get next to Thurl yeah. and you feel like a soprano. <laughs> I mean, he's down here like this when he's talking to you. So, um, but one of the funny things that happened, we were recording the, the show and Frank does amazing voice sounds right i mean he was like the original master of that and so he's making these funny little electrical sounds like there's pops and things and the engineers out in the control room Trying going to... i'm hang on guys i got a problem here because <laughs> thurl and i are like laughing we couldn't we couldn't show what we were doing he he kept it up for about five minutes and just drove the, the engineer crazy until we finally got it done that's uh, that's voice guys for you yeah, yeah yeah but it was it was great i got to, to do all kinds of voices throughout the parks for for my whole career there yeah and uh it, you know your daughter goes through and say hey that's my dad i remember coming out one time from country bear 
there and this woman, I did a voice for my daughter, one of the lines in this woman goes, hey, you sound just like that guy in the show. And it's like, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> no kidding. But it was fun. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so uh, speaking of like the, the voices, the radio and stuff like that, our, um, our listenership, uh, because I'm a skipper and I kind of get involved in a lot of the uh, former skippers. Well, I guess once you're skipper, you're always a skipper. That's right. Um, and so uh, the uh, I guess you wrote the script for the Albert Awall radio that's playing in the Jungle Cruise queues. Tell us about yes, that. that actually, so that makes you an honorary skipper. You never drove yeah, a boat, did you? Uh, one time during the WDI Christmas party, oh, I, think great. I, I did skipper it. Um, yeah, we were we redid it for the 20th anniversary in 1991, and um, we changed the queue and everything. And there was a, a guy who was part of SAC Theater for a while named Dan O'Sullivan. And, you know, when you're writing things, you hear characters, you hear the voices in your head, right? Yeah. You were very specific. And brought Dan in, and the first line he delivered, I was like, that guy's perfect. <laughs> and honestly, that's one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the... Uh, the recordings I'm probably most proud of. Oh, I just really? loved, I, I listened to it every once in a while just to go back and hear, yeah. but it's because of the way Dano delivered it. Yeah. I mean, it was just perfect. And uh, and he was the voice of Albert Awall, yes. who is part of the Q spiel, as it were. Right. He's, right. The, he's the voice of the radio that comes in and talks to us throughout, and then we mixed in some of the old music, and I think it just set up the whole mood for the Jungle Cruise so well, and uh, and it was again, it was Dano's performance that made it work. Yeah, it really did, and it, it carries a, a classic attraction and and just gives it so much backstory. And you know, even now, as we're we're recording this uh, about six eight months before seven months before the Jungle Cruise movie comes out, uh, so all of us Jungle Cruise skippers, we we this is our time, you know, if all <laughs> time the pirate star. the pirate people had their day uh, <laughs> about a dozen years ago, so now it's. Uh, a Jungle Cruise Yeah, and I'm world. sure it's been rewritten many, many times since, oh, since yeah. I did my version. Yeah. Uh, and with the Jingle Cruise, now they do it with the, uh, uh, there's great. some of the same stuff going on there. Um, uh, let's uh, let's talk about uh, your move over to uh, Universal Creative okay. uh, and uh, how, how, how that uh, transition was what, how, what pulled you in? What projects did you begin with? And uh, my first project at, at Universal Creative was uh, the one that Nate, Nate mentioned a minute ago was uh, the Simpsons ride, and I produced the the version both here and in, in Universal Studios Hollywood. So that was an interesting opening foray because I was like going back and forth yeah. between the two coasts to do a lot of it. Um, but it was a great experience. We were we were really blessed in that we got the actual Gracie writers and you know the people that really did the show still do yeah. the show they were involved in every single aspect and yeah. they wanted to make sure it was an authentic um, Simpsons experience yeah. and you know you're facing the thing where the people who still wanted Back to the Future to be there well, they were upset yeah. so not only <laughs> did we have to overcome that but you had to make sure that you satisfied the the you know world planet group of people who yeah. love the Simpsons you know yeah. unless you've been living on Pluto for the last 30 yeah. years <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me um so that was that was a challenge to meet that, but you know, with the with the help of the people at Fox and Gracie, we were able to really put together, I think, a great attraction. Yeah, and I think um, that that too, uh, being faithful to character. I was I was just talking to the Sally Rides people about their Sesame Street thing that they mm -hmm. put in Buenavent Buenaventura, and. It, they they went into you know Henson Studios and sat with the puppeteers. They, they weren't making animatronics off of their own ideas. They they were standing with the people who make those puppets work. And I want I want it to look just like those yes. folks. That's well, that's what that's what guests expect, right? You have yeah. to not only meet but exceed the expectations. Yeah. As you know, as Marty taught me, it's all about the guests. Yeah. And there's a continuation of the spirit of whatever um, IP people fell in love with, and you want it to make it real. That's so, right. If you if you don't give them what they expect it to be. If you make up something that has nothing to do with the yeah. IP, it's going to be a real problem. Yeah. So tell, tell me more. So Simpsons? Simpsons, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm not chronologically, but I did yeah, uh, right. the Springfield, uh, Springfield expansion where we created basically a second layer of the Simpsons mm -hmm. with all the great food products. Um, God, then, I love that donut. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love oh, my nice. favorite line is Homer's is donuts. Is there anything they can't do? You know? <laughs> um, but we had a lot of fun with creating crusty burgers and making sure everything was spot on for that. I mean, because if you think about it in the Simpsons, the food in, is almost as much of a character yeah. in most tavern as the, sh as the stars are. I mean, it's really a big part of things. So, um, But then when and I did uh, Despicable Me, Minion Mayhem mm -hmm. and got to work with a, another very talented group of people from Illumination Entertainment, again, that made sure their their characters and their uh, their stories were well told. Um, did the early uh, the blue sky development of the uh, Transformers 
the ride 3D. Yeah, that's that's um, tremendous. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. The, the best, and I did it. Um, I didn't go to the install in in any of the parks, but I led the development of the of the project and um, coming up with ways that we could actually take people through this two story building and they don't know they're in a two story building. Yeah, yeah. It's just amazing, and I still to this day love people getting off and you say, you know, you went up a flight, no. And you came back down. No. <laughs> but that's part of the great thing is you don't want the technology to be the story. Yeah. You want the technology to help you tell the story. And the best way to do that is to keep the technology out of, out of, out of view. Out way. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh, that, that's cool. What so, else? So, uh, let's see. Uh, the Transformers. Uh, the latest one was uh, Skull Island Reign of Kong that mm. took about three plus years of my life. Yeah. Um, and that was I was really proud of that. That turned out to be a, a pretty pretty good attraction. Well, uh, I we were we just wrote it the other day again and uh, th- thinking through the difference between Hollywood and here, what they're the limited space that they have, and then the expansive uh, nature of it here sure. just really uh, really makes it a full on wonderful storytelling well, that, that project. Was part of the challenge that we had to take it from basically part of the tram tour out in Hollywood. And bring it in, create our own space, you yeah. know, create Skull Island, and um, it was a challenge because in the time setting of the of the story is 1931. We didn't want to have videos or things in the queue to set it up, so we were we were really challenged at how do we create this anticipation of getting to the ride without media? Yeah, you know, that, right. That's almost unheard of these yeah. days. So we we really um, focused very hard on the layout and the physical space, in that we kind of pump people through. You go into an open area, then you go into a small area, then you go into an open area. So you're kind of being pulsed through. And the first layer is just the wind and these kind of ethereal sounds. Mm -hmm. And then you get a glimpse of of one of the locals. And then you come around the corner, there's the Shaw woman screaming and chanting and things are going crazy. Then you come around from that large area into the very tight caverners or cavern areas. And of course, then you get the live scare actor that comes out, which is the first time we had ever done that to put a live scare actor as a permanent part of an attraction. Yeah, that's 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 tremendous. It was great. And then when you I got up to they the love lo- that job. Lo- oh yeah, they, actually <laughs> these guys are amazing. They yeah. are so good at what they do. Um, but then you get to the load platform and the last thing you wanted to do is have people see a track, right? Cuz yeah, you spend right. all this time creating this story and you don't want them to get there and think, well, I'm on a ride vehicle. Yeah. So we really worked hard to come up with the first trackless system yeah. for our park so that when you got on that truck, the only thing ahead of you was adventure through Scotland. Yeah, Island. yeah. That yeah. that's tremendous. So to I didn't know that. I didn't know that is is the the driver that's up there is not actually steering it. I mean, I know that I know that the system is lit, throwing me around, but yeah, it's uh, well, we have five different drivers that you yeah. can ride with, which is one of the other things that we did to give a. It's the same story, but it's told in a little little different voice. That's so a little cool. Little different character. So for cool. It. So yeah, that was that was a lot of fun coming up with that part of it as well. Yeah, it's a ma- it's a great illusion, great yeah. trick. Um, so uh, that that puts, I think, a big question for anybody to see that you've spent so much time at Disney, so much time at Universal Creative. How's the approach different? I know we all think about things in different ways, but is there any significant difference between the creative process? I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I'm one of these people that always thought the term creative process, process was an oxymoron yeah. myself <laughs> because you, you kind of go through and you get to the process, but it all gets blown up. No, I think in both cases, you know, you start out, it's all based on story. You have yeah. to start there. And then you go through the iterations of the big idea and it gets kind of molded and moved around. And, yeah. you know, the end result is still that guest experience. So in, in either place, it's just about creating the best experience for the guest and, and putting that magic into the experience that yeah. they don't expect. Yeah, I, I asked the same question at some point to Bob Gurr, and he practically <clears> kicked <throat> dirt on my shoes. You know, process, forget process. Yeah, it's, you have well, to figure Bob it out. Like, he just made it up as he went, <laughs> he went along. along. Yeah, yeah, just figure it out. <laughs> no, it is true. I mean, you have to have a certain way to put things together, but once you start getting into the, the meat of things, you know, it just all breaks loose. Yeah. How do you tell a story when people listen with more than their ears? Stories change lives. They make us remember, but only when they are felt and not just heard. Storyland Studios builds the impossible. We turn big ideas into reality. We tell stories in three dimensions to stir the senses so you can walk into places you've only seen in your dreams, in real life, and real time. Storyland's artists, architects, and artisans take stories out of the imagination and build tangible dreams that leave lasting impressions and memories that endure for years. What's your story? Storyland Studios is themed entertainment, destination design, production, and fabrication. 
Connect with the team at Storyland Studios to get started building your impossible dream today. Visit StorylandStudios.com or call now, 800-218-1932. That's 800-218-1932. Storyland Studios, your big ideas, best ally. So our audience is, I think, two people. It's people who are in the industry doing uh doing their their stuff and they want to hear from their peers they want to hear from uh people who are a step ahead of them so that they can um move into that space uh-huh. learn from it but the other is the next generation folks who are just they're either in their first job or they're trying to find that first job so um let's say somebody wants to work in universal creative um where i'm not talking about the application process how do they get themselves ready to move into a career that way a lot of recess in school yeah. <laughs> That's what parents say. I said, what courses should my kids take? I said, recess. A lot of recess. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, you know, the best thing is to do is get involved, I think, in organizations like the TEA, the yep. Entertainment Association. Um, come to the IAPA shows and get to um, not only see what the product is, but get to meet and, and learn about some of the people that are involved. Yeah. Because that's really, it's a, it's a huge industry, but it's a very small family. Yeah. You, know, you, you see people every year and you kind of re, reunite with everybody. So it's, it's really... Um, going out and, and do new experiences, go to parks, go to do interactive things, just kind of get aware of what, what's around you and, and decide what tangible product you want to bring to the table. Mm-hmm. I tell young, young people this all the time in that they'll come up and say, well, I'm really creative. Well, yeah, everybody's really creative. Yeah. I believe that in my heart. They say, but if you come to one of my meetings and I'm a producer, I'm going to ask you, what are you going to bring to the table? Are you going to write something for mm-hmm. me? Are you going to do the schedule? Are you going to do the budget? Are you going to do a show set drawing? So be creative, but think about how you want to express that creativity. It's not to yeah. say you're, you're mired in that for the rest of your career, because the one great thing about this industry, uh, be it universal creative or, or imagineering, is that you're exposed to just about every discipline you can imagine it takes to yeah. create a project. So because you're in accounting doesn't mean you couldn't someday be doing creative design if that's where your heart leads you. So yeah. it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. Yeah, that, that, that's great. So I, that brings me to your passion. What, what makes you passionate about the work that you do? How are you? I think, and it sounds so old fashioned, but I think it's watching guest reaction. Oh, it yeah. really is. That's yeah. what it's all about. Because, you know, you spend anywhere from, you know, a year and a half, two years, three years, four years or more if you're doing a whole park. Um, creating something and the joy that you get i mean obviously you get paid and it's great working with the people in the company but it's it's the joy that you see when guests come and see the park yeah. and they experience it you know yeah. and you know that all the work you put into it has given them a little bit of an escape as john hench used to say it's yeah. all about being having an escape um and just seeing that they're having a good time and enjoying it makes you feel good and when they don't you have to find out why and and work hard and make it better the next time oh that's super so speaking of guest experience, um, uh, our producer, uh, the guy who designs the sound on this show, he's Barry. Hi, Barry. Hi, Barry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he is uh, located right near Hershey Park. That's his home uh, park. That's where he likes to be and likes to hang out. And I know you have a connection with Hershey Park. So what did you do there? I, I do. Uh, back in the uh, summer of 1977, I was a song and dance guy uh, <laughs> at a little stage down at the bottom of the, uh, of the, uh, of the hill near the the roller coaster and it was called uh, four on a stage and it was a western ah. thing so i wore i was the good guy i wore a white <laughs> hat and a white white outfit and uh i loved hershey that was one of the best summers of my entire life we oh, uh, we great. lived at 124 coco avenue and you know i mean you could <laughs> smell the chocolate i mean you, you walk down coco avenue to chocolate avenue and you went across into the park to go to work it was a great place i love hershey park yeah that's tremendous that i i'm i'm uh, I have never been, but we've been uh, looking at all their press releases lately. You know, they're changing that place up, trying to um, bring it into the new century, and just it's a it's yeah, it's going to be sure a great it's place. Changed a lot since, since yeah. I was there. Yeah, uh, you know, and what's interesting to me too, you know, you you talked about um, people mourning Back to the Future, and you know, you got to <laughs> in order to put in the Simpsons Simpsons ride. Um, you know, the people who have their own local. Uh, regional parks, they they experience the exact same one thing. Right now, they they're updating the front 
entrance. And Im- imagine if they took out the train station at Disneyland, yeah. uh, what people would be. That's kind of what they're experiencing there because they're trying to update that. And yeah, it's, it's always a fine line because you want to keep things moving forward and doing new things. And yet you have to be cognizant of you know, the history and the tradition and, and what the guests love. But mm. it, it's just like anything we develop. Nowadays, you can sit at home and do so many things. Yeah. So the challenge for us in the industry, is to, in the parks, is to keep designing things that you can only do at the park. Yeah. You know, you can do VR at home. You can do great sound systems. You can do a chair that rocks and rolls when yeah. you sit at home. But you can't have that social experience. You can do it online socially. But, you know, like on Kong, when you get on the, on the truck and there's 71 other strangers there, you go through this shared six or eight minute experience and then you see the same people later on in the park in another queue line and you're like high-fiving. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I really love about our, our, what we do is we, we create social opportunity in the old-fashioned way yeah. where you get to actually see people and talk to people and, you know, and be a part of a, a, part of a group. Yeah, you know, let you let down your hair when you go through that ticket exactly. uh, booth. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I as, uh, as as a cast member, we always thought, you know, people check their brains when they come in. You could guess sometimes do and walking into uh, ponds and things like that. <laughs> don't look uh, at your cell phone when you're walking. When you're walking. Uh, but but yeah, that that it is. It gives people an opportunity to make friends with a stranger from around the world. And, yeah, and you never know who you're going to meet. You yeah, know, I, one of the the best days I had in my career was I was given the privilege of escorting Jim Henson around oh, wow. the Disney Studios. And it was just he and I and, and one of his other guys. And um, you saw people's reaction to him. You mm-hmm. know, he, he just would go up and touch kids and talk to them. And there was he was such a kind and gentle and nice person. And we were sitting having lunch uh, at the Backlot Express. And it was just the three of us. And he said, uh, he goes, so uh, what's it like working for Disney? And I was like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, I'm having lunch with Kermit the Frog. <laughs> <laughs> and but he was this extraordinary person. I asked him for a signature for my daughter, and he actually took out and drew a whole Kermit the Frog oh, and signed great. it for you know. He was just amazing, amazing guy. Oh, that's great. So yeah, we we know what Jim Henson's known for. I'm gonna I'm gonna close with this. We were just in a meeting where uh, uh, Mario Mammon of Enchanted Kingdom in Philippines, he's like kind of the Walt Disney of uh, the Pacific, um, <laughs> and he uh, he ended his talk with, "Hey, what will people know?" think when we left behind did we did we uh uh shepherd this project well and so when we're we're gone what are people gonna remember so i you know without being too um you know overly introspective what do you hope people will uh remember your work for i i hope that they remember that i wanted to see the next generation and the young people coming up do better than i did Mm mm-hmm you know, the guys that I mentioned before and the people at Universal like Mark Woodbury and yeah. Tom Williams are leading and, and Terry Kugel is the creative studio that, you know, share what you know and don't be afraid that somebody else is going to do it better. Mm-hmm. Hope that they do it better yeah. because that just advances the industry and makes for a better guest experience down the road. Yeah, that's terrific. Well, thank you, Mike West. It's a real blessing to hang out with you on this lovely IAPA Florida morning. Thank you. Uh, I hope to have you on again if uh, uh, if we cross paths again. It'd well, be I have great. to save some for the book, you know. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> okay, well, uh, let me know when the book when the book's about to come out. We'll promo this episode, people. <laughs> you know, it, it'll be the short version. Great. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you. Wow. So Mike West, man, he he went from being a singing cowboy at Hershey Park through Walt Disney Imagineering to leading creative masterpieces at Universal Parks. Not bad at all. Yeah. What a what a journey. Um, Well, Freddie, I got to think, you know, with uh, his ever presence now at the Jungle Cruise. Yeah. um, (laughs) I mean, you guys kind of still have an alumni, right? A former skippers, right? (laughs) Where you guys are uh, at least honorary members of the Society of Explorers and Adventurers. Yeah, that's true. Which is kind of ever present globally. You've got the Royal Order of Ancient Cambodian Shriners. (laughs) You you got any authority to kind of, you know, get this guy some kind of honorary jungle skipper status? Well, like like Mike said, you know he's uh, he uh, he did drive a boat. I mean, I can't speak for all of the skippers in the world, but he did drive a boat. I guess at some party, and he wrote the script for our cue line. So I think you know I don't think any of us would disagree of uh, welcoming him to be an honorary skipper himself. Yeah, so it's uh, it's too much fun to hang out with these folks and learn from them. Uh, really thank Mike West for being part of this. Uh, speaking of skippers, this old skipper is ready to return to the dock. Uh, should we turn this boat toward home, Mel? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Until next time. The 
The Themed Attraction Podcast is hosted by Freddie Martin and Mel McGowan. We're so grateful you took time to listen to our show. You know, over the past 20 episodes or so, we've heard from so many of you, met you in person or online, saying how much this show means to you. Well, you mean a lot to us, too. Truly, you really do. Would you do us one more favor and leave us a positive review on Apple Podcasts? This helps us get the word out and share the show with so many more creatives just like you. We want to thank our guest, Mike West of Universal Creative. Check out the attractions he's helped design at a Universal or Disney park near you. Get access to more stories and interviews at themedattraction.com, an insider's look at theme park design by theme park designers. Start your own profile, discuss the latest creative advancements, and interact with your fellow theme park designers around the world. Follow the action on Instagram and Twitter at Themed Attraction and join our active discussion group on LinkedIn. Connect with Mel by email via mel at storylandstudios.com or follow him on Twitter at Mel McGowan and Instagram at Visioneer. You can find me at freddymartin.net and follow my adventures at Skipper Freddy on Instagram and Twitter. Our theme music was composed by Rob Watson. Other music provided by The Lost Dogs. This episode was designed and produced by the one and only Dr. Barry Hill. Find him at barryrhill.com. You know, Mel, it's been a while since we invited Barry to join us out here on the water. I guess that's because last time, it felt like we were on the longest river in the world. That trip went on for miles and miles. And nine, and nine. Thanks for listening, folks. <laughs>